Pierol, I think we can start the new section of the workshop with the next uh, two speakers. So it is my pleasure to introduce the first one, who is uh, Ron Kimmel, Professor of Computer Science at Technion Israel Institute of Technology. And today is uh, talking about uh, learning geometry. So please, Ron, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so thank you for uh, inviting me. And I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person. I really hope to see uh, uh, beautiful Italy and specifically Rome uh, in the near future. And I already have a certificate that would probably allow me to go there. Um, I was vaccinated twice and it's, it's nothing. I mean, uh, and it's great. Okay, so uh, what am I talking? What, what will I be talking about? Um, and, I would like to talk about uh, learning geometry. And when I say learning geometry, I mean using learning methods in order to understand geometric structures and to try to compare between them and, and uh, figure out how they are uh, built and constructed. Now, uh, deep learning uh, per se is a disruptive line of research that uh, changes the way that uh, computational problems are being addressed and solved. Um, usually it involves many parameters that one is optimizing for, and uh, uh, you are tuning these parameters to use some, uh, using some computational architecture, which is called the network, uh, and then you use it to classify, to segment, to identify, and, and reconstruct uh, objects. Um, now, this methodology works great as long as there is some assumption about the size of the data, and then you can use, for example, fully connected, what is known as fully connected network, uh, or some spatial or temporal uh, invariance like shift invariance property, and then you can use uh, the redundancy property of applying a convolution, and this is uh, the famous uh, CNN. Um, now, I, I would say that uh, there is a long history to neural network, but uh, if, if I would uh, go forward, let me, uh, yeah. so if I would go forward a little bit, uh, last year, or two years ago, actually, uh, Jan Lecon, uh, Jeff Hinton, and Joshua Bengio uh, received the Turing Award for the uh, being persistent about pushing the neural network to the game. So uh, Jan LeCun used, uh, uh, used the ConvNet in order to uh, understand uh, which letter is which. I mean, uh, and you can see uh, in this image where you have convolutions that are operating on the image and then you uh, subsample or um, it's called uh, pooling. And then at the end of the day, you have some uh, regression layer which is fully connected by which you know uh, which, uh, which image you are looking at. I mean, which letter, letter you are looking at. And for me, it was a great surprise. I think it was 2004, uh, where I heard, I heard Jan LeCun speaking in, in, uh, in Los Angeles about how he's using this convolutional neural network to get the best uh, digit reconstruction uh, that, uh, recognition that you can think of. And I still remember that I asked him, how come that if this is so successful, nobody is using that? And he told me, because everybody is stupid. Uh, now, my take home message from this, uh, from this conference was to uh, bring home the growth of house of distance and to try to compute it. But in retrospective, he was actually, uh, I mean, uh, he was actually hinting to something which is really, really important. And this is the fact if, that if you have a really powerful computer and you can somehow utilize the, the in, intrinsic invariant properties of your data, then you can do something. Now, this is something which is completely lost when you're, uh, uh, when you're dealing with geometry. Now, when I say completely, when we are looking at geometries, usually convolutions are something that are not a natural part of the game. So uh, in order to warm up this, uh, this uh, lecture, let me start with some classical uh, problems and then uh, push them and, and then push forward into uh, classical geometry problems when the, the question is how to choose the right coordinate system in order to be able to apply neural networks in order to solve the problem. And we'll solve uh, iconal, uh, iconal problems, I mean, computing distances, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so the first one is, um, involves, uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is not my paper, this is a presentation of Better and Blunt's 3DMM uh, from uh, more than two decades ago, in which what they did is scan the geometries of about 400 people, then they align them uh, one with respect to the other. So you have the X, the Y, the Z uh, coordinates of the geometries, as well as the photometries, as well as the RGB 
uh, so that you have these 400 faces, one aligned with respect to the other. And then they applied PCA, principal component analysis. And now they have the first, using the first three eigenvectors of the geometries and the photometries that they can reconstruct any shape in the image. So they reduced the difficult problem of trying to extract the geometry, the 3D structure of a face out of an image by manipulating only 300 numbers. And uh, uh, what we wanted to do is to train the network to do the same. The problem is that in geometry, you don't have as much data as you would have uh, in, in re from regular images. So we had to somehow invent or um, uh, create data that would uh, allow us to train a network. And what we did is we used the 3DMM, uh, the, the linear model of vector implants in order to do so. So this is what we did. And we were able to synthesize a lot of data that you can see here. This is a work by Richardson and Sella uh, together with Aurel. And um, since this is a linear model, what you can see is that most of these faces look as if uh, some identity after having a stroke or something like that. But the big benefit is that we also have the geometry. So we have the images and we have the geometry. And then we can do the following. We can play with, the, uh, with these coefficients, 300 coefficients in this uh, 3DMM space, linear space, and generate new faces. Since we have the geometry, we can now uh, rotate a little bit the pose. And we can play with the lighting conditions. I mean, we can render anything. And we can have a uh, uh, background that we just captured from the web. And this would be the data that we now feed our network. So the network would now look at the Caprio, for example. And what we would hope is that the convolutional neural network, at the end of the day, would spit out something that looks really like uh, the geometry of his face. And the question is, how do you do that? So our first attempt on the problem about three years ago goes as follows. What we did is, first of all, uh, train the network to get an image and output the 300 numbers in the linear space. And this is the reconstruction. This is what you would get. Now, we can see that the rough uh, shape of the Caprio's face are captured. But there are many fine, many uh, other fine details that are being thrown away because of the fact that we are working in a uh, bounded dimensional uh, uh, linear space. And the question is how to bring them back. Now, in computer vision, we were working with uh, axiomatic methods, uh, like saying that there is a known relation between the light source direction and the uh, normal of the surface. This is what you capture in the image. And what we did is basically, basically plugged in a shape from shading algorithm that would look at the discrepancy between rendering this image and that image and pushing back all the high frequencies using this uh, no, highly nonlinear but yet axiomatic method. So until here, sorry, until here we had the 300 numbers by which we are reconstructing back the rough uh, surface. And then what we did is we pushed forward uh, using, uh, using a shape from shading algorithm to bring back all the fine details. The next step was saying, look, if we have this axiomatic method, then we can use it as a penalty to train a network. And uh, then we had an end-to-end -end network, uh, but we uh, stopped in the middle in the 300 numbers uh, let's call it uh, latent space. And, and uh, we got this uh, smooth uh, surface in the middle and then the network basically uh, gave us the fine details. In the last attempt, what we said is, look, what we can do is completely get rid of this latent space and do a pixel to pixel network. And uh, now we have a penalty for the shape from shading and we have a penalty for the 3DMM. And what you can actually get is an end to end network that gets really nice results. And if you look at these results, um, um, uh, you can see that you can really get um, nice looking uh, reconstruction of, of images. So again, single image neural network that is trained on partially uh, a linear model and partially using axiomatic methods. Okay. Um, next, what we did uh, is uh, using guns in order to uh, synthesize images. So again, um, um, if we think about images, uh, about uh, geometries, so, sorry, synthesized geometries. And the idea here, this is work by Gil Shamay and Ron Slosberg, was actually mapping universally all faces into the same coordinate system. If you do that, then what you can do is use GAN in order to synthesize geometries. 
And these are geometries with different expressions. You can actually push it into the, into the model. And, um, and, and uh, you can actually show that if you, um, uh, if you, so let me show you what you're seeing here. Each point here correspond to a face and the distance between the points correspond to a distance between vectors that the face recognition system is producing. So the yellow points correspond to real faces that were sampled out of some community, out of the real population. And you can see that there are these uh, concentrations of faces that correspond to uh, probably Caucasian, uh, Asians, and Afro-Americans, and there are obviously some in between. And within each group, you would see probably the males and the females. So there is this rough separation between the two. If you would just sample from the linear model, uh, then what you would get is something that looks like the red points here that correspond to the linear model, the 3DMM, which is basically a Gaussian that is not representing the true population. If you are training a network, then the network would synthesize faces that would correspond to uh, the distribution of faces in the real world. And this is how it uh, looks like. I mean, what we did is uh, taking the NVIDIA reconstruction of uh, synthesis of images of faces, and we also pushed into, into that the XYZ coordinates. So you can see that, uh, and you do it obviously course to find, and this is a really nice and interesting, um, an interesting problem. Yet another problem, in which you have images and you just try to understand what is going on in these images uh, goes as follows. Let me talk about, um, about the following collaboration with, uh, uh, this is a project led by Gil Shamai, but now he's, uh, he got his PhD. And what we did is by looking at something which is uh, known as biopsies, we were trying to understand whether in this, uh, this is, in this specific case, it's breast cancer, what is the hormonal receptor of these uh, images that we see? Now, let me explain you a little bit about that. Uh, when uh, somebody expect, I mean, suspects that there is a, a problem, there, there may be cancer in the breast, uh, what you do is you take a sample, a tissue sample from this, uh, from this, um, uh, from this uh, uh, place in, in the breast. And immediately what you do is you color it with something which, uh, with, with a very, um, uh, cheap and uh, easy to manipulate coloring, which is called hematoxylin and eosin. And these are the images that pathologists are looking at. And looking at these images, pathologists would, could immediately tell you whether there is cancer and what is the severity of this cancer. But what they cannot tell you is what are the hormonal receptors, what is the biological characteristics of this, uh, of this cancer. And this is really important in order to uh, design efficiently the treatment. In order to understand what are the uh, hormonal receptors of the, of the cancer, what they do is they stain it with something which is called immunohistochemistry. And it would, it would immediately tell you whether there are uh, estrogen uh, receptors or not, according to which uh, nuclei it colors. Okay, so here in the right part, you can see the uh, brown ones, which would indicate that there is ER positive, estrogen positive, um, uh, nuclei in this uh, in this cancer, and, and it would um, it would tell the physician to treat the, the the patient in one way rather than this one. So what we're looking at is looking at these tissues and trying to infer what would be the immunohistochemistry result. And in fact, if you feed a lot of data to these networks, uh, in many cases you can do this pred prediction. So this is a paper that was published last year in uh, JAMA and, and we show that uh, looking at enough images, uh, you can actually, in some cases, bypass the, the need to color uh, this kind of biopsies with the mono, uh, immunohistochemistry stains. Um, okay, it made us locally famous, but let's uh, continue to the more complicated uh, problems. So the three previous problems that I uh, talked about are actually non-geometric in nature. I mean, we, we, at the end of the day, we mapped everything into an, into an image and for an image, we know what to do. So the X, Y, Z coordinates are mapped to an image and for the images, we just apply, not plane, but something which is like uh, a convolution. I mean, convolution your networks, either unit, pixel, pixel to pixel, to pixel, pixel, pixel to pixel, or whatever, and you get the results. The question now is what happens when uh, uh, things are breaking and you no longer have this nice convolutional property to the game. 
So let us uh, try to follow Rene Descartes' uh, idea of uh, how could we use algebra in order to describe geometry. I mean, if we go to Cartesian coordinates, this was an idea that, uh, that uh, Descartes uh, introduced. And let us look at the simplest problem you can think of. How do I match two planar shapes? So I have these two uh, dolphins or uh, sharks that I would like to compare between. Think about it as two uh, pieces of a puzzle that you would like to see whether they are identical or not. So what people in differential geometry are often doing are plotting a function uh, traveling along the boundary of this planar shape and plotting a function of the curvature as a function of length. Okay, so each and every point here correspond to one over the radius of the oscillating circle and uh, parameterization would be the arc length, Euclidean arc length of traveling along this, uh, this uh, planar shape. And we can do it also for the second chart and then we can shift one uh, graph with respect to the other and if they are identical, I can say that these two planar shapes are identical. Can I train a network to compute for me the uh, curvature, okay? And the trick here would be the following. The trick here would be that the curvature is a differential operator. So what I can do is uh, zoom into some sampling of this, uh, uh, of this curve, of this boundary, no matter how you represent it as a set of points, as, as uh, polynomes or as a splines, whatever. But the moment you have a small number of coefficients to play with, you can use uh, a fully connected network in order to uh, figure out uh, what would be the output, the invariant measure uh, of, this, uh, of, this local, uh, of this local behavior along the curve. And this is a joint work with uh, Gautam Pai and Aaron Wetzler. It was published three years ago. And, and uh, again, traveling along this contour, uh, you can basically uh, throw the consecutive 10, 20, 40 points into a network. Now the network, the only thing the network knows is the order of points and the coordinates of the points. It doesn't know how the, um, how the sampling has been done. I mean, the sampling is something which is completely arbitrary. This is how you push into the network the invariant with respect, with respect to reparameterization. And then what you can show is that the network is producing, the blue one is the graph of the network, is producing something that uh, correlates with the Euclidean, um, um, uh, Euclidean uh, curvature. And in fact, you can generate a signature for these kind of uh, curves that would be really robust. I mean, it could be ro as robust as you like and uh, uh, very interesting. Now, in that paper, uh, what Gautam did is he didn't compute the arc length. Now we know how to compute the arc length. So there is a way of training a network to compute the curvature and the arc length. And again, here the trick is to reduce the dimensionality into uh, 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 tens or hundreds of points and that's it. And then you don't need to resort to convolution. You just shift your network along the boundary of the, of the curve and you need to operate on a finite number of, of uh, points mm -hmm. at any time. And this is how you would produce these invariants. How could you apply the same trick in order to solve the Iconal equation? Okay, so this is again a paper uh, a year and a half ago by um, Moshe Lichtenstein. And uh, we know that in order to tackle the Iconal equation, you need to learn about viscosity solutions. You need to come up with really sophisticated Gudonov type method that will tell you how to uh, look at upwind schemes and, and uh, things that I've been involved uh, with for, uh, I would say almost two decades, but are non-trivial. They are not trivial to teach and they are not, not trivial to come up with and to prove theorems on. Um, um, and the question is, can we throw all this into a network that would come up with, with uh, something that would be really efficient and at the other end would be able to compute uh, a viscosity solution to this kind of equation, okay? So this is an equation that would compute the distance for you. And the trick is to look at the point, say that we are considering a, a regular grid and to number all the neighbors of these points and to feed all these neighbors into a fully connected uh, network that in this case would, would take 12 points, okay? So you take all the neighboring points of a specific point and you throw uh, all the behaviors of distance functions that you can synthesize into a network and you train to net the network to come up with the solution at, at, at the central point. Now, if you do it properly, what you can show, now a little bit uh, of history about solving the, uh, 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 the iconal equations on, on regular grids, uh, 
the accuracy of something which is known as the fast marching method was, was order of age and the complexity of computing that was uh, was actually quasi linear i mean it was n log n n is the number of points and h is the spacing between points in the grid it took about five years to come up with a second order uh, second order accurate scheme and there is also a third order accurate scheme but i don't think that there is any viscosity proof to the third order viscosity scheme on triangular meshes, things are a little bit more challenging. Uh, um, about two decades ago, uh, we have been able to come up with an, uh, with an order of H accurate scheme. I mean, this is again, fast marching method on, on, on triangulated domains. And at the other end, there was something which was called the uh, exact geodesic problem by, uh, that was first implemented about two decades after the paper was published, uh, Suratsky. Uh, Vitaly Suratsky and, and his colleagues published a, a numerical solver for that, that gave birth to an, an order of H squared uh, algorithm. But the complexity of this guy was order of N squared. I mean, if you really wanted to get the accurate, accurate, the order of H squared, um, it was accurate because the distances were, comp were, were computed accurately on the triangulated, on the uh, po polyhedron that was describing your data. But if you consider the smooth version, then it is order of H squared uh, algorithm, accurate algorithm, but it was order of N squared uh, complexity. And the question was, how can we, I mean, can we actually uh, use an order of N algorithm with uh, order of H squared complexity? You throw it into a network and surprise, surprise, uh, this is what you would be getting. So let me just go into, uh, into this interesting graph. So what this graph is showing us is, uh, uh, is when you are taking uh, a shape on which you know what are the distances, for example, a sphere, and you are, uh, uh, you are uh, reducing the size of the length of the edges of, 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 uh, of your triangles, the question is how, what is the rate of convergence to the true solution? And you, we have shown that if we are training our network right, then our solution would be as accurate as the exact one uh, and this is where the uh, convergence rate of the uh, fast marching method looks like, okay? So a neural network can replace the local update scheme of our uh, fast marching methods, and uh, you can get in linear time or quasi-linear time, second order accurate uh, results, which I think is really interesting uh, uh, result. Okay, next. Uh, Next, I would like to introduce another. So this lecture would not have uh, a skeleton, but rather you just have you just see the, the parts. And there is an interesting problem, a classical problem of how would you uh, try to classify rigid objects. And if we go uh, more than 100 years ago, the idea was that you can look at an object, at an object that is described by a set of points by considering the moments of the object. So just uh, so we know that the sum of all the coordinates of, of these points would give you the center of mass. Okay, and then, uh, I mean, obviously normalized by the number of points. And then the second order moments would, be, would give you the uh, main uh, axis of rotation of this object. And if you add more and more moments, and moments are described by uh, summing over the x, y, and z, these are the first order moments, x squared, y squared, z squared, x times y, et cetera, et cetera, then uh, if you accumulate enough of them, then you can represent well the object that you're looking at. And if you're uh, truncating it after a while, you can use these moments as a way of comparing between objects. And this is how things were done, I would say, until 87 or the 90s. Um, so let me just represent the whole issue of moments in the following way. Assume that you have the points of this airplane. So you have the x, y, and z coordinates of point one, point two, et cetera, et cetera. And now what you do is you lift them into this uh, coefficients, x, y, z, x, y, et cetera, et cetera. And then you average over the first coordinate. So this would give you the center of uh, all the x's. The second coordinates, it would give you the center of all the y's, et cetera, et cetera. So at the end of the day, what you would be getting is some vector, finite number vector that would represent somehow the uh, airplane. And you will try to use, I don't know, SVMs or whatever in order to classify using these vectors as features in order to classify your objects. 
Uh, now let me jump into something else, into a neural network that was operating on the same objects in order to classify them, which is known as point net. So again, the difference is not so big. Now, rather than uh, deciding on X, Y, X score, et cetera, et cetera, what you do is you train a neural network uh, to take each and every point and lift it into a thousand dimensional space. So each and every point that was three dimensional is now thousand dimensional. And now what we do is exactly as before, you sum, in fact, you max pull along each and every axis and you get a thousand dimensional vector. And with this vector, you are trying to do the classification. So you feed it into a fully connected network, at the, sorry, into a regression layer at the end, and you're trying to uh, recognize whether you're looking at a plane, a chair or a table. So what is the relation between these two methodologies? I would say that the relation is quite straightforward. If, I mean, this is an if, if you, we would expect uh, the um, axiomatic methods, the idea that uh, the claim that uh, moments represent our objects, uh, then what we can do is um, think of this space as, as uh, something that holds the moments, the ingredients of, uh, that would help us to, help us to cook the, the, the moments of the object, okay? Now, neural networks have really tough time computing uh, scoring numbers. If you need to multiply two numbers, the number of layers that you would have to have for your network is logarithmic in the uh, number of bits that, uh, uh, that, that you need in order to represent your, your number, okay? So you, you'll need at least uh, something which is proportional, proportional to the range of numbers that you would like to represent in order to multiply two numbers. So let's help the network. Let's tell the network, look, you would do the lifting, the heavy lifting into higher dimensional space any way you want, but rather than just giving you X, Y, and Z, uh, three points, let me now give you 10, 10 numbers. So I would give you x, y, and z, and x square, y square, etc., etc., x times y, etc., etc. It appears that if we just pre-lift the input to the neural network this way, then what you would get is that the point net, the point net is again a method that was introduced by, uh, by this uh, group from Stanford. Um, so it appears that, um, uh, that you improve I mean, you reduce the amount of memory that the network requires. And at the same token, you also improve the accuracy of the network. So again, by just looking at a single number at a time, I'm not talking about feeding normals and feeding whatever, you can use uh, uh, this idea of lifting and then shrinking into a thousand dimensional number uh, and get better results by resorting to the fact that uh, something similar is happening when we uh, work with moments. We called it moment uh, because we're using moments in order to uh, work with nets. And, and again, this is, I think, an interesting observation. Uh, let me confuse you a little bit uh, with the following problem. So let me first of all introduce the problem and then confuse you. Assume that you are getting uh, a shape with a given, again, using the same idea of point net, of the idea of somehow uh, uh, lift, um, reducing everything into a thousand numbers and then somehow lifting that into uh, something that I can look at. So the problem, assume that I somebody is giving me a reference shape, so Q would be my reference shape, and then a sampling of the shape in a different pose. The question how from Q and P can I reconstruct back uh, P uh, with the fully connected uh, uh, vertices as if I was looking at Q. So again, the idea is somehow uh, manipulating Q so that it would give me a full observation of P. Okay, so this is how the ground truth was looking at, and this is, how the, this is what the network is producing. Now, what this network is producing, and again, this is a joint work with Oshin Halimi, Emmanuel Rodola, and, and uh, others, um, the, the, uh, the idea was that uh, in order to um, uh, do so, what we need is to train two networks, two Siamese network that were doing exactly the point net idea. So you reduce everything into a thousand dimensional space and the uh, latent space, the vector would be what you get from the partiality and what you get from the full, uh, from the full network. And the decoder would now take the reference frame and the uh, uh, what we get here as the uh, latent space 
and the output would be the result. So again, the idea is to somehow reduce the dimensionality of the, I don't know, millions of points that we are looking at initially into a latent space, into a small dimensional space that would be able to capture uh, the essence of translating Q into the pose of P. Okay, so this is yet another interesting uh, problem. Now, going back a little bit, um, uh, we have looked into, into shapes and uh, trying to represent them as manifolds. So what is a manifold? The manifold is a topological structure. So a mug would be, uh, would look like a donut and uh, a shape like that would be equivalent to a sphere if we don't use metric. Now, in order to do something useful with that, we introduce a metric. So now uh, the question is how we, we measure distances on the surface comes into play. And what we would like to, to say, what we would like to somehow measure is what is the difference between these two surfaces? I mean, when I'm embedding my hand in 3D space differently, I would like to have a measure that would quantify these, these uh, discrepancies. I mean, what is the difference between these two, uh, these two structures? So what we do, what we did, I would say for almost two decades is try to approximate the Grom of Hausdorff distance um, in order to do that. And we, uh, there was a long journey. But let me just give you the essence. The essence was taking all the intergeodesic distances between points on surface S and all points on surface Q and try to somehow map the metric S into Q so that the distances would be uh, would not distort too much. Okay, this is called the chrome of Hausdorff distance. So assume that somebody is giving you all the intergeodesic distances between all points in, in one space and all points in the second space, and now you would like to map to, to match them. And the question is how to do that. And while one way is to resort uh, to the functional map idea. So again, thank you, Alex, for introducing functional map. So functional map in a brief is uh, projecting, for example, uh, similar indicators on two shapes uh, into basis defined on these two corresponding basis defined on these two common on, the, on these two shapes. And it appears that uh, if, you, if we would like to uh, translate the coefficients of uh, this function to its corresponding function here, we need to resort to a specific, uh, to only one uh, matrix. So this matrix would be, uh, would be independent of which uh, feature I'm selecting on these two dogs, I would always have to play with the same function. So again, I'm looking at F, this would be my function F on the horse projecting it onto its uh, eigenfunctions, for example, of the Laplace Petrami operator, getting alphas. If I get corresponding alphas and betas, um, a lot of such vectors for these two shapes, I can solve a problem that would give me the correspondence between these two shapes. Okay, so this is functional maps in a brief. Uh, this is what is going on mechanically. So you have shape X and shape Y, you extract the eigenfunctions, for example, from the Laplace Petrami operator, and uh, you are doing the inner product uh, with the uh, features. You get your alphas. You do the same for shape Y. You get your betas. And the uh, permutation between uh, shape X and shape Y would be nothing but uh, this kind of a structure that you see over here. You need to truncate it. You need to project it into a permutation. But in a, in a rough, uh, roughly speaking, this is what you get. How can we, uh, and this was introduced by Ostyanikov and the Stanford group um, uh, in 2012, Mirella Benchen, Justin Solomon, Gibas, and others. The question is how can you uh, improve on that methodology? I mean, how can you uh, push, how can you use this in order to uh, train networks to do that? And this is the work by Litani and Alex and uh, Emmanuel and others and uh, Michael. And the idea is to uh, uh, somehow replace the features by something that neural networks can digest. And what uh, Litani did is uh, see that if you use some sort of a feature like shot, and now think of a shot of, um, of producing colors for the object. So you, you think about producing 300 numbers. So rather than just RGB, Think about having 300 red, green, blue, et cetera, for the same object. Now, if you use these, these numbers and you project them onto your eigenfunctions, you will get some alphas. The problem is that it would give you uh, not so great uh, permutation that would really uh, do the job. So what Vitani suggested is to somehow 
um, cook them differently. And for that, you use a neural network. Now, since, since I'm talking only about 300 features, then fully connected neural networks to do the job. So think about a couple of layers of uh, fully connected 300 uh, uh, connected uh, networks. And at the end of the day, what you get is a different combination of these features that would give you better uh, reconstruction at the end. Now, in order to train this network, what uh, Litani had to have is uh, this correspondence between these points in, in one shape and the other. So you need to have it really supervised in order to solve for the neural network that to solve the problem. What was Oshri Halimi noted is that if you give up the supervision and you resort to, um, to the following, to uh, asking the intergeodesics in Y to be close to the intergeodesics in X, and you optimize for the network that would give you the, the nearest, uh, the nearest uh, mapping between the distances in, 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 in Y and the distances in X, you can actually get uh, an unsupervised way of uh, comparing between shapes. So I think it was a really uh, nice observation and we are not done yet. Um, and again, she showed that uh, you can do almost, I mean, as good as, as uh, all the rest of them, it's in fact, a little bit better. And uh, you can also handle uh, partialities. And uh, another interesting, you can actually train your network for two given inst instances. So you don't need to have a lot of instances and then train their network. You can just train them given two shapes. The only thing you need to know is they are almost isometric and you can train your network to blend your shots, your features in a way that would give you the best, uh, the best correspondence between shapes. Um, I promised you that this is not the end of the story. I still have a little bit of time. And what I will show you now is a different way of looking at uh, functional maps. So now I have the same shape, okay? I have the shape, uh, I have the same manifold M. And what I would do is treat the manifold M differently using two uh, matrices. So I assume that I can measure distances differently uh, for the shape uh, using two different ways of measuring distances. What I can do is define something which is called self-functional maps. And this is nothing but the inner product between the eigen corresponding eigenfunctions from the two corresponding Laplace Beltrami operators. So I define one uh, Laplace Beltrami operator with respect to this metric, another one with, with respect to that metric. It appears that the inner products between the corresponding eigenfunctions would provide a signature for the uh, surface. So what are two different ways of measuring uh, distances? For example, think about scale invariant distances. So scale invariant distances would uh, be nothing for a planar curve would be nothing but the curvature time the arc length, okay? So this is a way of computing distances uh, for, uh, that would be invariant to scale for planar curves. You can take this methodology into uh, surfaces. And in fact, a scale invariant metric would be nothing but multiplying the regular metric. In fact, it's a pseudo metric because the Gaussian curvature could be equal to zero, multiplying the metric coefficients by a Gaussian curvature, okay? So now we have uh, a scale invariant Gauss uh, uh, Laplacian operator. And now we can decompose it and have scale invariant Laplacian eigenfunctions. So wh what you see here at the top are the eigenfunctions of the LBO painted onto the surface when using the regular metric. And at the bottom, you can see eigenfunctions of decomposing the scale invariant metric, okay? And you can see that in the scaling variant version, you can see the high frequencies uh, uh, appearing much more, uh, much faster. I mean, if you order them according to the uh, eigenvalues, uh, where you have effective Gaussian curvature, for example, the fingerprints, the, the fingers of the, of, the, of the object. So what we now do is let these two eigenfunctions uh, talk to one another. I mean, just take the inner products. So say that I'm taking the first seven here and the first seven there, and I'm uh, doing the inner product between them. What I would get is this kind of a matrix, okay? Uh, so again, taking the shape S, taking the eigenfunctions, uh, uh, taking the metric G and the metric G tilde, extracting the corresponding eigenfunctions, doing the, uh, the inner products, I'm getting this matrix. So for all these horses, I'm getting this kind of a matrix. And for all the ladies, ladies I'm getting this kind of a matrix. And I basically translated the problem of uh, classifying 
uh, horses into that of uh, finding the distances between corresponding matrices. Okay, and this is called cell functional maps. And if we apply it to uh, various shapes, what you would get here, each point correspond to a shape in a different pose, and the distances would correspond to, cor to the corresponding distances between matrices. And you can show that you can actually do very well. Uh, you can classify shapes quite well, so it not be a big trick, a big uh, issue to compare between horses and, and persons. But if you go into the false data set, you can also show that you can classify objects uh, in different poses quite quite well using this kind of a method. Not the end of the story. This is the previous idea, okay? The previous idea was again, taking X, extracting features, blending them using neural network and, uh, and training them in an unsupervised manner. But we were really unhappy with the shot. I mean, a shot is, is as, as kind of a feature that would not guarantee any, anything. At the other end, when we are looking at the Gaussian curvature uh, of a function, uh, it appears that uh, at least there are, um, there are some claims by uh, Peter Olver and others that the essence of the shape is there. So the question is, can we replace the shot by something else, something that captures features in a, a multi-scale fashion and, and work with the same idea? And what we did is rather than feeding shot to the game, we fed the eigenfunctions with respect to the Laplace, to the scale invariant Laplace Beltrami operator. Okay, so this is a work by Amit Bracha of Frihalimi and Frihalimi. And the idea is that uh, rather than feeding into the network uh, a shot, what I would do is feed the eigenfunctions of the scale invariant LBO. And now what we realized is that we don't no longer need a neural network, but what we need is somehow to uh, blend properly, uh, not blend, but rather uh, selectively rotate the eigenfunctions of the uh, LBO so that they would fit between the two shapes. If you think about it, it is something like uh, uh, joint diagonalization, but not exactly. Okay, so this is what Amit did. So what we, you need to do in order to uh, uh, match your eigenfunctions with respect to the scale invariant LBO to the eigenfunctions with respect to the scale invariant LBO of the other shape is rotate uh, the eigenfunctions with a um, um, unitary band limited uh, matrix in these uh, two corresponding shapes. And now what it does is optimize for this rotation matrix. Now note that this is a neural network free uh, problem. Uh, we do use the tensor uh, flow um, uh, methodology in order to optimize for the Rs, but uh, the optimization is done for every two shapes given the intergeodesic distances. And you we find for if each and every two shapes, the relative rotation in the spectral domain. And at the end of the day, we use the functional map idea in order to achieve the correspondence between shapes. So, so just to show you that if I'm taking these corresponding eigenfunctions before the rotation. Then after the rotation, you can see that the colors correspond to one another. So again, before, for example, the legs look completely differently from the point of view of the colors that correspond to corresponding eigenfunctions. After the uh, relative rotation, you can see that it works quite, fun, quite fine. And again, you can do that uh, for, I mean, if you have done it for uh, two, you can do it for all the eigenfunctions and for many, uh, for many shapes and you get quite interesting results. I think that uh, I'm running out of time. So I think that I would stop here and just tell you that again, the, the message in this lecture was that we can use all the nice, interesting methodologies that we did uh, until 10 years ago. And this is the axiomatic methods in order to boost our understanding of which spaces to use when applying them to geometry and get uh, quite interesting, and in some cases, quite state-of-the-art results. Uh, so thank you for your attention, and I really hope to be able to uh, visit in person uh, in, in Europe, in Roma. Thank you, Ron, for your uh, really interesting uh, talk. And uh, uh, now there are uh, some questions. The first one is by Emanuele Rodola. So Emanuele, please uh, activate your uh, audio. Yes. I run into painting in the, in the car box. Is it uh, the university? Sorry, sorry. The panel painting that you showed. 
The final painting, yeah, it's, it's uh, actually uh, something that I did with my daughter in uh, the Technion at the parking lot of the university. You're welcome to see that. <laughs> so that was not my question. Okay. So the question is about the deep iconal pipeline that you showed uh, briefly during your presentation. So actually, I have the suspicion that it would generalize very well to uh, unseen shapes. Have you tried like training on a few abstract shapes like spheres and cubes and stars, and then applying it to compute distances on, on humans and animals? So how well does it generalize? Of, co of course, this is what we have done. Uh, we know how to compute distances accurately only on spheres and combinations of spheres. And uh, so you can compute and, and um, I mean, so, so we can compute uh, distances and spheres, or, or I don't know, if you join two spheres together, you can do something, or, uh, and, and, and planes. So what we did is we sampled the sphere different with the different sampling strategies, and as well as the planes. And this is how, uh, and now you land on a point, uh, you, and, and you know what is the distance from some source point. And uh, using this analytical knowledge of what is the distance, then you uh, extend your uh, trained network into, into uh, I don't know, stars and arbitrary shapes where you don't have the, uh, you don't know anything. Why? Because when you zoom in, at the end of the day, you will have something which is, I don't know, you, you can approximate locally by a sphere or, or I don't know, or other, other things on which you can know the analytical solution for the distances. So this, right, is, right. Mm -hmm. so this is how Moshe was actually uh, training his network. I see, okay, okay, thank you. Okay, there is another question by Maurizio Falcone regarding sure. the way to solve the equal equation. So Maurizio, you have to activate your audio. So, okay. uh, I run the, the, the example you made on <clears throat> the solution of the equal equation is on a structured grid. Uh, so I, I don't get the, the, the main idea which is behind that. So using the, uh, the deep neural network, uh, you, are, you are trying to, uh, to teach the system how to solve the equal equation. Exactly. What is your starting point? The training set would be a set of uh, separate distances computed, computed on several domains or so, given so surfaces. So what, what is the training set for this system and how can you compare this to the standard final difference approximation? Okay, excellent question. So let's think of the uh, regular grid. So you have two dimensional regular grid and uh, we know, I mean, we know, uh, it took about uh, 20 years and a lot of proofs that uh, you and your colleagues have done to, to show that if you use, I don't know, uh, the mean between the, the or the max between the backwards derivative and the, at the end of the day, you have some combination of looking at the point and the neighboring points and computing the local update so that uh, when you plug it into a gradient Q equals one, you would get the viscosity solution, okay? Now, uh, it took many years to prove that the uh, numerical solutions are indeed satisfying the, the, the iconal equation, the, I mean, the viscosity solution to the iconal equation. The, the trick goes as follows. You know on the plane, in the plane, that the distance between that point and that point, I mean, you know analytically the solution. So now feed these triplets, these four points, I don't know, and, and look at uh, some larger support about the point of the true distance, okay? Now you can actually play with that. You can give the distance only for uh, all the points that are, at all the points that are smaller than the value of yourself. So the network is trained to look at all the numbers uh, that are smaller than your own values and come up with this non-linear uh, combination of values that would give the best solution it can. Now, how would you train the network? You, you would train the network with distances between two points and now you start playing with the two source points. So if we look at the, uh, at the level sets, it would be something like that. I mean, this is how the level set would look like. Uh, why? Because for two or three points, these are things that you know how the uh, distances behave analytically in the play. Um, once you have trained the network for these, uh, uh, again, the training is, is the network at the end of the day 
obtains uh, 30 numbers and outputs and outputs uh, one number at the end. Okay, the number would be how to update the point uh, PI. What would be U at point PI? Now, it doesn't matter where this neural network is landing, wherever it would land, it would look at the neighboring points on a structured grid and would output the, and the values, corresponding values of U at this, at this grid, and the output would be a value. Now, what is the relation between that and finding the min max uh, or min mod or whatever? There is obviously a relation. I mean, in the neural network, you have reviews, which is basically finding the, the D minus, and you have, uh, you have minimum. I mean, the further reviews would, could, could uh, correspond to minimum or to min pooling or max pooling. So the network has uh, the structure of being able to produce non-linearities. Okay, exactly the same non-linearities that we are using uh, that we are using in our uh, backwards and forwards uh, uh, selection of derivatives. Um, we have actually tried to look at uh, how they are related, at least for the fair, for the case of computing the curvature. And over there, we could see uh, structures that look like in the features that look like uh, backwards derivative and central derivatives. I mean, we can we could we could see stuff like that. But how it is blended in the network, I don't know. The only thing I, I, I can tell you is, is uh, that I know how to look at the convergence rate. And if the convergence rate is good enough, uh, I, can, I can make at least empirical claims about what I'm saying. Again, this is not a rigorous viscosity proof. Uh, it's a claim, it's an observation, it's an empirical uh, uh, observation about the solver that we have. That we have. Okay, but um, I have another small uh, question. There is a variation on this. So can you handle the same problem with a function uh, multiplying uh, the, the modulus of grad u, the norm of grad u, and this function could be cx, which is a velocity. So cx times the, the norm of grad u. Oh, so then having, yeah, something like this. The moment, if you have structures on which you have solutions, so you, you'd like, if, if you have structures for which you have a solution for that, and you can train for that, then yes, you can do that. Uh, but again, I need to be uh, really careful about how to do that uh, because, because uh, you, you see, because the moment you limit, you don't, I mean, you don't want to limit yourself for any f of x. Uh, so if you'd like to be as generic as possible, I'm not so sure that um, we need to think about it. I mean, you need to have analytic solutions to, to some equations like that. What you'd like to do is something like that. Is it some anisotropic diffusion or, yeah. or, or, or you'd like to have, to have a solution for that. So you think that is feasible provided the F as a given structure or as some properties, but not for a generic nonlinear vector field? No, no, no. For a generic non-linear vector field, you need to add more assumptions. And again, this is how you would synthesize your data by which you are training your network. And again, note that here I'm falling onto uh, a well-structured uh, mechanism to update points. This is the diaspora, the, the, the idea of uh, using this uh, dynamic programming idea, uh, saying that I can advance, that there is some natural order to my, uh, to my objects. Uh, if you can show that similar things are working here as well, uh, I need to think about it. I'm not so sure that since you have diffusion here, I'm not so sure, sure that you would be able to claim for um, uh, for upwinding. And, and I mean, it, this this problem needs to be more. Uh, to, it's it's not it's not just uh, something that you can solve immediately. We need oh, to no, think. I can't imagine. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, there are uh, other questions. I have just a really quick, that is uh, a curiosity. In the first part of your talk, when you show uh, face reconstruction and then you refine the result uh, solving the Schiffer shading problem, I would like just to know if you use the classical Lambertian uh, reflectant model or other uh, reflectant model. Classical Lambertian uh, reflection model. I assume that I at every point X and Y is equal to the inner product between the normal of the surface and the light filter action. 
this is this. Oh. and again there is some albedo there, there is some albedo but we can we can extract the albedo quite efficiently uh, because the whole face have more or less the same uh, the same um, uh, the same albedo so this is something that we can that we can extract now so this, you assume that is a, a no albedo no i assume that there is, there is albedo that, and i can reconstruct that in in um, okay. In fact, what we did is we introduced a very similar idea into the Intel's RealSense. Uh, and over there, you can see in real time how this uh, equation is operating. Uh, again, what we do is we assume that there is some smoothness to the albedo. So you assume that uh, over the image, uh, the, uh, I don't know, the Dirichlet energy is, is uh, somehow bounded. Um, but, but, but again, since you have a good prior, you have some initial N0 uh, to align with, so you can also add that as a penalty to your, uh, to your domain. Uh, obviously, there should be some inner product here. And what you're looking for is, is this N that you would optimize for. Okay, so you have not tried to use a null inversion model to see the no. difference. Oh, yeah, we did. We did try to use null inversion model. Uh, there is uh, Aurel, uh, the student at the time, who, yeah. again, it was about uh, a, a, more than a couple of years ago, was trying to also use non inversion uh, shading models. Um, uh, Roberto Mecca was actually uh, doing that at the time, but then uh, what we did is we uh, introduced specularities into Aurel's uh, model. Okay, so you use the Fong model, for example. I used the yeah Fong or uh, Durant, yeah, one of them. So you can also uh, introduce again. The idea is that if you have a strong prior, uh, then you can optimize for these kind of non inversialities And in the, the in the example that I showed you, we have a really strong prior. Otherwise, uh, you, you have you have these uh, ambiguities that you end up with. Okay, thank you, Ron. I have another question, but uh, it is now time to move to the other speakers. So I will uh, ask you later in the break. Okay, so thank you, Ron, for the, this interesting talk. So now we can move to the second speaker of this section that is uh, Will Smith from the Department of Computer Science, University of York in UK. And uh, He's talking about self-supervised inverse rendering. So please, uh, Will, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. And um, thank you to the organizers for, for uh, pulling this off, even though we can't all be uh, enjoying the better weather and food in Italy. Um, and a word of warning, my, uh, my daughter's being homeschooled downstairs. So if you hear any screaming or furniture throwing at the wall, um, don't be alarmed. Okay, so um, this is work um, primarily done by two PhD students, uh, Ye and Tatsuro, um, and they both fall under the, the kind of area of inverse rendering. So um, by that, I mean, not only estimating geometry from images, but also some of the photometric information. Um, so, I'm going to talk about two areas um, on, on this kind of broader topic. And they use deep learning. So we're, we're trying to learn to solve the inverse rendering problem. But the goal is to do it without needing any direct supervision. So any ground truth um, examples of the quantities that we want to inverse render. So the two examples I'm going to talk about, the first is a network that learns outdoor scene level inverse rendering. And this works by self-supervision using differentiable rendering. Um, and I'll talk about a few extensions to this work as well. And then I want to mention something that's kind of a current idea, and we've had one go at trying to do this. Um, we're calling it backwards rasterization, um, and it's this piece of work is class specific. So it's, it's for faces, and it makes use of the 3D morphable model that Ron just introduced in his talk, so that's very helpful. Um, and the idea of that line of work is trying to avoid forward rendering in the self-supervision and therefore avoiding problems of um, rendering not being um, differentiable. So the task I would like to solve is um, I'd like to be able to go out and take a photograph. This is the Minster in York. And 
I would like after the fact to be able to, for example, edit the lighting or change my viewpoint or um, extract the geometric model that I can do something else with. And I would like to be able to do that in the wild, outdoors for um, completely uncontrolled scenes. And what we're really asking when we try to solve this task is why does this image look the way it does? So can we provide a complete physical explanation for what gave rise to this image? So there's a few ways you might, um, oh, a few kind of sub problems that you might consider trying to solve in doing this. So one question is, um, what should we estimate? How, how should we represent it? So for example, for geometry, we might estimate a per pixel normal map. Um, this is nice because then we don't have to worry about um, occlusions, for example, that would be present in a mesh. But on the other hand, we can't reason about shadowing or self-occlusions if we, if we only work in the surface normal domain. So we might estimate a depth map or a mesh or um, recently implicit surfaces have been um, gaining a lot of ground as a good way to represent geometry. We'd also like some material properties. So at the very least, the diffuse albedo, so the intrinsic color of um, the materials in the scene. But maybe we would like more than that, for example, some specular parameters. We'd like to estimate the illumination in the scene and then perhaps something about the shadows. So this is a very hard task. And um, deep learning is already able to solve some components of this quite well. So for example, uh, mono depth, monocular depth estimation works, works pretty well. Um, but some of the quantities here, things like diffuse albedo, we have no means to um, reliably measure them in the wild on these kind of scene level um, settings. So the question is, where would we get the supervision from to do this? That kind of uh, motivates what I'm going to talk about. So the kind of the general scenario is what if it's very difficult or impossible to obtain training data? Um, so in other words, we're trying to solve an inverse problem or learn a solution to an inverse problem. And we don't have um, any solution to this problem. So we can't extract training data. So, I mean, two possibilities would be one, use the output of some imperfect existing algorithm. But then in general, we're just learning to replicate the performance of that, which may not be useful. Another option would be to synthesize images. And this is a promising direction. If you can synthesize very realistic images, um, then, then this, this is a good direction. And Ron talked about doing this for faces earlier. But the generalization of your, your learned solution is going to be limited by how diverse and realistic the training data that you can synthesize is. So, the benefit of self-supervision is that we don't need this direct supervision. We don't need ground truth um, for the network to learn to, to predict. Um, the network can learn it just from the input data itself. So let me sketch how this works. So let's say that we'd like to solve the inverse rendering problem. And the idea is that we know how to model the forward problem. So let's say that the, the quantities we're going to try and predict are surface normals, albedo map, and lighting. And we know um, through kind of physics-based reflectance models how we can um, combine these quantities through some kind of differentiable renderer to produce an output image. So for example, we might use spherical harmonic lighting, which depends on the surface normals and the, uh, a light source vector, and an albedo map to produce an image. So we know how to model the forward process. And the idea is we're going to train a, a CNN to solve the input, uh, to solve the, uh, the inverse problem using this model to supervise the task. So we have a black box trying to solve the inverse problem. We have a fixed model that simulates the forward process or rendering. And the training signal that we exploit is the difference between these two images. So this is what we did in inverse render net. Let me show you what this looks like. So we have an image to image CNN, which takes a single image as input and it directly regresses um, like pixel wise an albedo map and a surface normal map. 
Um, from these two quantities and the input image, we can actually directly solve for lighting. So rather than um, learning to predict the lighting from the input, uh, we found um, it's more efficient and um, the training is better behaved if we actually directly infer the lighting in the network. So um, this box here relates to solving um, a linear least squares problem to find the lighting coefficients of our spherical harmonic model. So then we can put lighting normals and albedo back into our renderer, predict an image, and then the error to the input image provides us with a supervisory signal. And there's nothing, there's, there's no direct supervision in here. So all we're doing is providing lots of examples of input images. In a sense, the supervision is coming from our model of image formation. So how um, these inverse rendered quantities can be turned back into an image. Now, of course, this won't work because this problem is highly ambiguous. So you can see, for example, if one trivial solution would be to just copy the input image into the albedo map, um, make the normal map planar, and you would exactly recreate the input image. So this problem is highly ambiguous. For example, um, one interpretation of this image would be that there is a, a, a 3D violin hanging on the wall. But actually, the true in interpretation is that it's a planar shape with that texture painted onto it. So to try to learn to distinguish between these different interpretations, we need more supervision. And there are really two key tricks to make this work. So one was loosely inspired by human um, uh, performance at this task. And we know that when humans solve um, the sort of inverse rendering or shape from shading tasks, they seem to exploit some priors. So one of them, which is very strong, is that we tend to assume lighting is coming from above. So the fact that we interpret this as convex and this is concave is consistent with um, assuming the lighting comes from above. So the first thing we did was to try to give the model um, some knowledge of natural lighting and how natural lighting varies. So we, we went and collected um, a few thousand um, environment maps, so spherical high dynamic range images of natural environments or outdoor environments, not necessarily natural, could be man-made. And then we learned um, a low dimensional, in this case, just a linear model on the spherical harmonic coefficients. So this is showing the first few dimensions of the space that this illumination model learns. And you can see the sorts of things it captures are that lighting generally comes from above. Um, it captures some kind of uh, side to side motion of where the brightest light in the sky is. So I guess this is like the, the sun passing overhead. It captures that sometimes you have a diffuse blue sky um, versus a, um, a more directional um, like uh, sunny sky. And what we do with this is we can now restrict our predicted lighting to lie in the subspace of this model and therefore ensure that it's consistent with what you would observe in a natural environment. Okay, the second trick to making this work is to exploit multi-view information at um, training time. So most of you will be aware of the great success of uh, multi-view geometric methods for reconstructing um, 3D models. So if we take a completely unstructured image collection and give it to a structure for motion algorithm, we can actually um, get very reliable estimates of the scene geometry and the camera positions, um, even when this um, image collection contains very wide changes in viewpoint and illumination. And we can exploit this for um, this sort of photometric vision. So, the idea is that we have um, image collections of the same scene. So we just go on Flickr or something and search for images of a, a certain scene. And we get to observe the scene under widely varying lighting. And then we can ask that the network um, is consistent in its uh, estimation of photometric invariance. 
So these two images are captured under very different lighting, but we know that the albedo at each scene point should be the same. And we use our offline multi-view stereo structure for motion to give us a depth map and the camera parameters that allow us to cross project between these two different viewpoints. So we can now ask that the albedo in this image cross projected is equal to the albedo um, estimated in the other image. So we require um, some albedo consistency. There are a few other tricks to make this work, um, but that's, that's kind of the two main ingredients. So I'll show you some results and then some extensions. So at inference time, our network requires just a single input image and it predicts an albedo map. So this is sort of the intrinsic color of each material in the scene, and it should be largely devoid of shading. We predict illumination and a normal map, the cell normal map here. Um, interestingly, the, the quality of this normal map is, is better than we can get from multi-view stereo, um, which we use partly in our supervision, even though the multi-view stereo is getting to see many hundreds of images and our network's only getting to see a single image. Um, for one thing, we avoid um, any holes. The network is very good at kind of predicting um, what the geometry might look like in dark regions. This is just a rendering of our predicted geometry with Lambertian reflectance, and this is um, with the estimated lighting. Now, this worked quite well, but one of the biggest drawbacks was um, not, not dealing with cast shadows. So I'll show you in a second, they, they would tend to get baked into the albedo map. And when you do relighting, this causes quite large artifacts. So we've been playing with uh, an extension where we also predict a cast shadow map. Um, there's nothing to make the cast shadow map physically correct. It's, it's just a per pixel grayscale value. Um, but by playing with um, how, how we compute the losses, we can kind of encourage this to mainly explain um, cast shadows in practice. So the idea is the same. We regress these three maps. Um, we can then um, divide out the shadows from the input to get a shadow free image. And we use that in our appearance loss. So let me just show you the improvement we get by dealing with cast shadows. So um, the second and fourth row show the, the original method. And these input images contain strong cast shadow. So under this balcony, there's a strong cast shadow. The old method would bake this shadow into the albedo map, which means if you change the lighting, you're stuck with the shadow. The new method is able to remove the shadow from the albedo and explain it mainly in the um, cast shadow map. And then if we divide the shadows out, we can get this kind of shadow free image. So here's a few more results from this method, including shadow prediction. And you can see across quite a, a diverse range of images um, with very varying lighting, we're able to get um, nice looking geometry, plausible lighting estimates, and um, albedo that um, seems to factor out the effect of geometry and shading. Uh, in the paper, there's, there's obviously a lot of evaluation on things like intrinsic image tasks. So getting back to York Minster, um, this is just showing running this network um, independently per frame um, on a video. And if you look at this panel here, this is a rendering of the predicted normal map. So this is doing a really nice job of predicting the geometry. Um, you can see that the shadow map is kind of over explaining. So a lot of high frequency texture ends up in the shadow map and dark regions often end up being explained as shadow rather than dark albedo. And um, so this is still an open problem. So we were kind of amazed at how well this works and we were sort of intrigued by what is it actually learning? Like, is it learning shape from shading or texture or shadows or ambient occlusion? Um, what cues is it exploiting? Or is it kind of just memorizing what it's seen so it might be that it's seen so many examples of windows that it can just recognize a window and kind of copy a good window shape from its massive database of things it's seen before. So if that were true, it wouldn't have learned, 
if it only learned the semantics, it wouldn't have learned any general principles of shape from shading or shape from um, some other cue. And it wouldn't generalize to images it had never seen before. So it turns out it can generalize to some extent. Um, this is an image that was uh, popular recently um, for the kind of um, ambiguous interpretation you can make on whether these plates are convex or concave. Um, our network has never seen images like this. It's seen outdoor, primarily man-made scenes of, of tourist sites. Yet we're still able to predict um, normal maps that are reasonably good for this sort of input image. Um, so the interesting thing here is that uh, we flip the image uh, upside down in this case. Um, and rather than just interpret this as in the same way, just invert the lighting and then um, keep the, the shape estimate fixed, actually it's interpreted the scene on the left as primarily con convex shapes with lighting from above and the image on the right as concave shapes, again, with lighting from above. And that's because we baked in this lighting prior um, of natural light, which typically comes from above. Um, it's also interesting to look how it behaves with some um, other kind of illusions. So this is um, a, a mirror box sitting in a scene. And unsurprisingly, our network um, does not predict the geometry of, of the mirrored box. It, it just analyzes what it can see in the reflection. So it has no model of uh, mirror reflection to interpret this scene. It's also fooled by a trompe l'oeil. So um, this is just a painted uh, texture on the, uh, on the building. Actually, our sky detector is also fooled. So it, it thinks this is all sky and it predicts the geometry of this, the scene and these painted windows, for example. Uh, here's another trompe l'oeil um, around the Louvre. And again, you can see it, it largely falls for this. Although in this case, it has a very strong prior on the ground plane, which kind of fights against this uh, illusion. Okay, and a final illusion. This was, um, this was a photograph of a wind turbine blade that was being transported through a city. And a lot of people thought it looked fake, like the wind turbine blade, blade had been photoshopped on top and the explanation for why it looks fake is that people are interpreting this as a cylindrical shape. And if it's cylindrical, then the lighting estimate from the cylinder is not consistent with the rest of the scene. In fact, this blade is S-shaped in profile and the, um, the lighting is consistent with the rest of the scene. Interestingly, because we force our network to interpret um, with a single lighting estimate for the whole image, it does predict this S-shaped profile, so it doesn't fall for this illusion. Okay, I'd like to show an application of um, some of this work, which is relighting. So we can take um, an input image, estimate a normal map, lighting and albedo, and then we can change the lighting and predict new appearance. And we were a bit disappointed by this. So it sort of gets the, the gross, um, appearance right, so the color of the light is is captured, and the the general pattern of shading is is not captured, uh, is captured, but the fine detail is not. So we wondered if it was possible to use um, CNNs neural rendering to try to learn to correct all of the um, the kind of missing details in this image. Another issue is that we don't know what to put in the sky to be consistent with this relit image. So this diagram is extremely complicated, but I'll just sketch out the rough idea. So basically we take an input image, we inverse render the quantities that I showed you before. We then provide novel lighting that we would like to use in the re-illumination. And we give a number of different channels to a neural renderer. Actually, you can just give the re-rendered image and it does an okay job, but it works better if you give it access to normal map, albedo map, an error map in your basic relighting um, and the desired new shading. And then this neural renderer um, tries to um, kind of emboss all the details that are missing in our basic Lambertian relighting. 
We then have a, another component, which is that we predict a sky using a GAN, a conditional GAN, which is plausible given this relit image. So we try to find a sky consistent with the foreground image. And the trick to training this is again, using these multi-view image collections, we use a, a lighting condition that comes from another real image. And then we can supervise this relighting um, using an image taken under different lighting um, and require that the neural rendering looks the same. So this, this works um, surprisingly well. So here's an input image, and this is um, now some, some new lighting that we'd like. So in this case, for example, the illumination is coming from the right-hand side. And this is our um, predicted image. So you can see that a lot of the detail that was missing is now back. It's kind of hallucinated things like um, shiny windows that would not be captured by the Lambertian model. And the GAN is also hallucinating skies that are somehow consistent with the relit image. So there's a, a couple more examples and then I'll just show a video. So now we're rotating um, the desired lighting, um, input on the left and then the relighting result on the right. So while this is still not quite photorealistic, you can see that the pattern of changing um, shading and shadowing is reasonable. And it's also interesting how the sky kind of changes to be consistent with the, the relit foreground. Okay. Um, the last thing on the scene level inverse rendering is that we've started to look at um, how this relates to depth estimation. So there's there's a lot of work on monocular depth estimation. And while um, the results of those methods are quite impressive, um, they're particularly good at, at capturing ordinal relationships, so working out what's in front of what. Actually, the depth maps predicted by those methods um, are quite limited in terms of the detail they capture. And this is really because of the challenge of how you supervise these methods. So if you use direct supervision from LIDAR or multi-view stereo, the supervision itself is limited in, in resolution and quality. Um, there are self-supervised methods that do slightly better, but um, even then, uh, they struggle to reconstruct fine detail. So the benefit of our inverse rendering approach is that we're using all the information in the image um, in our self-supervised loss so that the normal map can um, capture very fine scale pixel level detail. So as a first step towards this, we tried an idea of just merging a depth map from a, a mono depth network with our normal map from inverse rendering uh, using this method from Nehab in 2005. So this is just a fixed um, method to combine the two. And this works surprisingly well. So this is a rendering of the mono depth prediction from mega depth. And then on the right is a rendering of the depth merged with our predicted normal map. And you can see that um, this corrects some, some kind of gross errors, but also introduces a lot more fine scale detail. Okay, so the last thing I'd like to do is introduce some more current work. And this is um, much more kind of speculative and, and just really an idea at the moment, but we have one concrete attempt to implement it. So I'm moving on to a class specific method. So uh, Ron introduced the idea of a 3D morphable model, and that is that you can approximate the geometry and photometry of a class of objects like faces using a low dimensional model learned from 3D scan data. And this simplifies the, the reconstruction and inverse rendering task, because now you just work in this low dimensional parameter space. So the, the sort of first attempt to do this in a self-supervised way um, is uh, the, the well-known method of MOFA. So the idea is that you take an input image and you use a CNN, very similar to how I showed for the inverse render net, but now instead of predicting pixel-wise quantities, you're predicting the parameters of your model. So shape and texture parameters and lighting parameters. Um, and then this goes through 
uh, what they call a model-based decoder, but this is really just a differentiable mesh renderer to produce an image and you have a self-supervised appearance loss between the input and output. Now this works reasonably well. Um, there's, there's quite a lot of engineering required to make it work. Um, but the, amongst other challenges, one of the fundamental problems is that rendering or rasterizing a mesh or the rasterization of a mesh is not differentiable. So the rendering is only differentiable up to a change in um, rasterization. And there are various attempts to overcome this. Um, for example, using soft rasterization. I'm gonna describe something, uh, a different way of dealing with this. Um, so the discontinuities that appear um, uh, are basically twofold. So the first is that in rasterization, you have to decide um, which pixels are covered by each triangle. And if you move a triangle side to side, um, there's a, a discontinuity when a pixel suddenly becomes covered by, by a triangle. So there's no gradient to tell you the effect of changing that rasterization. And similarly, um, if you think about visibility, if you have a triangle behind another one and you gradually move it forward, at some point the visibility flips, but there's nothing in the gradient um, to inform the network about the effect of that. Okay, so rasterization is the idea of um, taking a mesh and then for every pixel, find the closest mesh triangle that covers the pixel. And then once you've got that correspondence, you, you do a shading calculation to compute a color for that pixel. And usually that involves other rasterized quantities like the depth map, normal map, albedo, and so on. So we have this idea of backwards rasterization, which is given an image, try to predict the buffers. So that could be normal buffer, depth buffer, that would have aris arisen from rasterizing the model, and then solve an optimization problem to find a model consistent with those predicted buffers. So it looks something like this. So we have an input image, we have an image to image CNN, and that's going to learn to predict um, this set of buffers. But we're gonna choose the buffers in such a way that we can design an easy or an easier optimization problem to recover the model. So that would be geometry, uh, maybe texture and so on. Obviously we need to know something about the model for this um, not to be completely ill posed. So we're gonna restrict ourselves to a 3D morphable model. And actually the most important um, buffer that we're estimating here, I've called it a face buffer, but really this is a correspondence between pixels and your model. So somehow you're encoding for every pixel um, the point that that corresponds to on your model. And the idea of, of this backwards rasterization is that the goodness of fit here can become your learning signal. Um, and in that case, you don't need to re-render the model back into the image. You can just directly look at this, the residual of this, this fit, and that tells you how good your buffer estimates are. Uh, obviously, the solution to this optimization problem has to be differentiable. Um, we, design everything so that th this optimization is just a linear least squares problem. So I'm just gonna briefly show you our first attempt to do this um, for faces using a 3D morphable model. So our network predicts this correspondence map. It also predicts a depth map, so like a Z buffer, and we predict a confidence, which is, is useful for making it um, robust. Um, you, I guess you would say this is like a stencil buffer in rendering. So the idea is that we're going to train this network in a completely unsupervised way by having a fixed process which solves the linear least squares problem to fit our 3D morphable model to this correspondence map, depth map, and uh, confidence map to give us a 3D model and a texture. And the residual of this fit is our learning signal. In practice, you also need some regularization and Kind of disappointingly, um, up till now, we do also still need to use a differentiable renderer and include um, a reconstruction loss. If we don't have this, um, the face kind of expands too large uh, for reasons um, that are a bit complicated to explain. Um, 
I think I'm going to skip over the detail of how we solve this uh, this least squares problem, but suffice to say, um, this information, correspondence, depth, and confidence, is sufficient um, to set up a, a linear least squares problem to first solve for the geometric parameters, shape and camera parameters, and then for albedo and lighting. So a bit of rationale for why this is a good idea. It turns out that correspondence is uh, a minimal representation. We can compute all the geometric parameters from that. And once we've got those geometric parameters, we can compute photometric parameters in closed form. Um, this sort of image to image problem seems better suited to CNNs. You can get away with a smaller network um, and they seem to be much easier to train. Uh, every pixel can contribute to the loss. So uh, if you render a mesh, if the pixel is not covered by the model, then the pixel doesn't contribute to the loss. Whereas with this correspondence, even if the pixel is not covered by the model, it can still contribute. And a really nice property is we defer estimating the actual geometry until later. So the network only learns to predict these buffers and then we can um, use any additional information we have at inference time. And we can train this network in a completely unsupervised way. We don't even require landmarks. I'm going to skip over another um, detail to finish with some results. So um, let me show you what the network predicts. So here's some input images. We've intentionally made this really hard by applying random 2D transformations. But the correspondence prediction is still um, really robust. This is a mapping of the image into this canonical UV space. This is the depth it predicts. This is the confidence. From those maps, we can then infer um, geometry shown here and albedo shown here. And the, the overall reconstruction is shown in the second column. So you can see there's a good match to the input image. Um, a really cool thing about this is if, for example, we have multiple frames from a video, single frame fitting is a bit inconsistent and low quality. But we can exploit this information when we do the linear solve for geometry to say, for example, the camera parameters must be fixed and the geometry and um, albedo must be fixed. And we get a big gain from using multiple frames. OK, here is um, video fitting result. So we're limited by the 3D multiple model. We have to stay in the space of the model. Um, but this method is trained in a completely unsupervised way, given only um, face images. All right, I'm going to finish there. I hope I haven't gone too much over time. Um, the kind of takeaway from this is that models can supervise learning. So you don't necessarily need um, direct supervision on, on what you want to predict. But models themselves can provide you with a supervisory signal. Um, and I think the only kind of closing point would be to say that all models are wrong. Um, the Lambertian model is a, a gross simplification of most materials. So there's a broader question about what is the right balance between modeling everything um, and learning. So for example, should our reflectance or rendering models be partially or fully learnable? I will stop there. Um, so thank you for listening. Thank you, Will, for your interesting talk. So there is time for question. There is one by um, Matthew Peisenberg. So Matthew, please, you can uh, activate your audio. Peisenberg. Are you able to? OK, I will uh, read your question. So uh, could you give the few key differences be with the works based on light feed like NERF and following? Yeah, OK. Um, so that, that, that's a very interesting um, development. Um, so I think the first thing to say is uh, NERF, um, the original NERF um, 
doesn't decompose appearance um, in the sense that we don't explain the appearance in terms of lighting and material properties. Um, there are various follow-ups and Nerf in the wild is a really um, impressive step in that direction. Um, although still you kind of bake this image style um, which kind of uh, mixes together um, lighting and albedo. Um, so th it doesn't provide a full decomposition. There is another follow-up piece of work that is heading in that direction. Um, I guess the biggest difference is nearly all of those NERF-based methods require multiple images. Um, everything I've shown here requires a single image at inference time. Um, so th that would be the biggest difference. Okay, thank you, We Other question? I have just a small one. Uh, what about the CPU time for the uh, rendering uh, problem? So, I mean, these are all methods where the training is really expensive and the inference is like trivial. So um, once the network is trained, a forward pass takes like a few milliseconds on the GPU. Um, so you, you could with a bit of engineering, probably run these in real time on video. And for the training, more or less? Training, like, uh, you know, a matter of days on the sorts of GPUs we can afford. Okay, thank you. So if there are no more questions, you can, we can, thanks again, Will, uh, for the interesting talk. Now you, uh, you can continue to discuss with the two speaker here in this room with uh, Ron, the first speaker, and in the other room with uh, Will. And uh, then uh, there will be a lunch break, a real lunch break. And then we start again at half past two with uh, the talk by Elisabetta Rocca. So you can stay here, I think, uh, until uh, the speaker are available. And then uh, have a nice lunch and see you later.